make no comments about my fellow colleague threat modelers. They're all, there's only four of us who've written books about this. And uh, you know, you can decide which ones you think are, are decent, but you know, it's not a huge body of literature. I think maybe six people have actually read my book. Um, and so, you know, I'm sorry? Yeah, I'll get, I'll, I'll, we can do that after. There'll be time. Okay, I'm gonna get started with some of the stuff, but we'll, get, you know, we'll let people, people filter in as, as they want. Let's get started. So um, this is a little bit about me, why you should listen to me or not. And uh, I'm not going to read all this stuff, but I've been around for a while, for about 30 years, making trouble. And um, my feeling about this is blah, 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 show me the money. Let's see. You can decide after this presentation whether, whether some of these things you know, are worthy or not. A um, couple of things. I have to tell you, in order to speak and, and follow my own policies, that I work for Intel. Um, otherwise, they shoot me. And, uh, but this is, material is not the property of Intel. I started it long before I worked, worked for them. And it's my material. But feel free to use it, really. The idea here is to help people get better at this thing we need to do, um, called threat modeling or secure design, of which threat modeling is a piece. And I'll explain that in a bit. So. Um, this little mnemonic that I use, or pedagogy, is not a hard piece of um, theoretical or uh, otherwise. Um, it's not really a method. You go talk to, uh, um, now I've forgotten his name, I just saw him, Tony UV. He has a real method, and, um, and I do not. I have a pedagogy because I've taught this to hundreds of people, um, literally by now, absolutely hundreds. And so it's just a, mon a mnemonic or a pedagogy. Okay, so uh, here's some expectations from this session. If you're entirely new to threat modeling, at least you'll understand what it is and you can get started. That's the point. Um, for learners, we're gonna dig deeper and maybe get some more skills. Uh, for you experts, um, maybe you'll get some tricks and get out and teach threat modeling. We really need people to not just do it, but to teach it, because we all need, people who are involved in software security need to be working on design, and I'm gonna make some points about that. So, let's start with the uh, participatory part of this. Just shout out, or raise your hand, and I'll call on them. Um, what do you get out of this uh, set of boxes and arrows? Anything at all? In fact, let me ask you this. Has, have any of you, ever gone into an architecture review and seen an architecture that looked like that? See, a few people, right? And what did you do with it? I mean, literally, there's not much there, right? It's pretty scary. How about this one? Do we know a little more? <laughs> well, we know there's some kind of thing someone thinks is a firewall, and we know there's a back end and something that we think of as a user. At least that's something. We know there's some data flow, right? Because the thing about threat modeling is that it's about, um, it's about understanding and understanding in a certain way. And so this doesn't, this, this is actually a real architecture somebody actually gave to me, which, you know, I couldn't do anything with. So, um, let me set the problem, the essential problem we're working on here. We have a design problem in software security. Um, we have to build appropriate security. How do we get there? Let me make some points here. Everybody know about the GPAC? Anybody not know G about the GPAC? Okay, well, my friend Chris Valasek and someone else um, got onto the entertainment system and then started mucking with the brakes and the ignition on the car while it was going down the road. So, um, so is that a coding problem? I'm willing to bet that that Jeep Wrangler met the MISRA coding standards and got all of the other stuff, that it passed all of its stuff that it needed to. Why did this get out there? Because they did not 
talk about secure design. This is a design problem. You don't put an entertainment system open to the world on a life or death bus. That's a design problem, not a coding problem. Are we clear about that? Here's another one. You don't get a universal password that's going to go out everywhere in the field and thousands and thousands of things. That's a design problem. It's not a coding problem. And then we'll go to this one. Different kind of design problem. And that's why I want to put this up here. This is a different kind of design problem. Everyone knows about the target hack, right? Right? They lost 40% of their business from this. So highly impactful. Um, and this is a situation where one vendor had access to the entire network. That's a system level design problem. It's not a coding problem. Nobody made any coding mistakes. They hacked, I mean, maybe there was something in the, in the HVAC vendor that got them in. I don't know about that. But the fact that they had all this access is a design problem. In fact, whose company uses the same VPN profile for, for everything, for everyone when they get in? Vendors, whoever. No, don't hold up your hands. You'll break your NDAs. But just think about that. <laughs> right. Don't hold up your hands. We don't want to see those hands. Thanks. Um, <laughs> because you will break your, violate your NDAs with that. All right. Here's a start. Dal and I worked on this. Um, my uh, Christoph is here who worked on this. 13 architects, two and a half months, a small book. Uh, I don't think IEEE has ever seen the like. Um, but nevertheless, it's a start. If you're, if you're wondering what we're talking about in terms of secure design, this is a start. It's Creative Commons. So I stick this in here because I encourage you to download it and read it. We have a design problem. Now, I want to I wanna switch gears here a little bit and say that the point is you've got to get the right requirements. How do you get those? How do you get the requirements in so that as people are designing and architecting software, they come up with the right security stuff? the authentication system, the way to handle a credential, as in the Juniper problem, or in the sense of thinking about, about uh, VPN profiles, for instance, to get the right structure of different kinds of access. How do you do that? Well, one thing you got to remember as we go through this is just a little tip. The early requirements get the worm, so to speak, because there's a mindshare thing that happens over time. When the security person comes in and does the analysis after the thing is darn near built, what happens? Everybody has mind share, and it seems like an interjection. It seems like an insult sometimes. So when you can get in there early, so there's a timing part of this, which we're not going to delve into. I do delve into it a little bit in Core Software Security, um, which is the book previous to my last one. But we're, we're not going to... We're not going to delve, delve into this much, but I wanted to make the point so you're on top of this, that earlier is better, but too early you can only do so much. So there's a nice little balance there that's an experience thing. And just, you know, talk to me later, write me, I'll give you a bunch of links to contact me with. Um, we're not going to go into this much. And I just wanted to mention it. Now, let's take a look at this slide here. Does this, this bear some thinking? Architecture. The reason we use architecture and call it architecture, it's a tool for managing complexity. Complex systems, and we, you know, I showed you a couple of architectures, we're going to see a lot more. Complex systems are too much, when it's too much to hold in your head, you know, beyond hel hello world, then you start playing with larger blocks that say, okay, I'll group all this stuff together and I'll group all that stuff together and then I can sort of look at it and understand the structure of the thing. Okay? So it's our tool. That's important. Threat modeling is the tool for secure design. It needs an architecture. It needs to understand structure. And as we'll see, you look at things in different ways. So, you know, architecture is our, our thing for understanding complexity and also for playing with change. What if we do something this way. Well, you can take the blocks and move them around. You can move the arrows around and say, okay, what does that mean? How does that work? And so it's both a tool for managing complexity, for understanding it, and a tool for um, playing with change, potential change. 
Threat modeling requires architecture. You have to understand the structure of a thing while at the same time understanding it from the point of the attacker. Okay, let's move on. Um, threat modeling, I like to say, is applied security architecture. So if you're a security architect, where the rubber meets the road, where you apply all the stuff you know, is when you threat model. Okay, we good with that? Any questions about that just yet? Are you with me? Okay, so let's go on. Um, I put this in, in every one of my slide decks because when I say secure software, um, everybody thinks of something else. One person thinks, oh, the pen testing. Get the vulnerabilities out. Oh, the authentication system. I'm using HTTPS, aren't I secure? How many times have I heard that? H HTTPS is the architect's peanut butter for security. I mean, I'm seeing a lot of people are laughing, and if the other folks don't get the joke, the inside joke here is, if you've been to a lot of architecture reviews, time and time again, the brilliant and fabulous solution architect, when you come in and say, I want to look at the security, will look at you and say, we're using HTTPS, as though that's the final answer to all things. Um, so I put this up here because I want to I I establish what I mean by secure software. And interestingly, all of these are design problems. Only one bullet point up here has anything to do with vulnerabilities. I'm not s suggesting that vulnerabilities aren't important. And I don't really care what the number distribution is because the attacker's only looking for their leverage. If they got one good design flaw they can manipulate, they don't care how many vulnerabilities are there or not. You know, um, vulnerabilities, wrong word, bugs, uh, coding implementation problems. And if they can find one good coding implementation problem, they don't care if the design is rock solid. It's not, that's not the way th um, attackers think. Okay, so let's get started here. Let's get rolling. Here is an architecture. Um, I'm not going to tell you anything about this architecture for a moment. Folks, feel free to shout out, except for Dell, um, <laughs> and maybe Christoph, because he knows, he knows. But feel free to shout out and say, yeah, and also um, Robert is a brilliant threat modeler. You guys, shh, mom's the word. Um, what do you see here? Anybody? What is this? Say again? Shout out. Yeah, 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 right? Everybody see that? You got a user, you got an internet, you got web servers, you got an application server, and you got databases. Um, this is actually called a three-tier architecture. It's pretty standard. Um, but what don't we know, which is kind of interesting when we look at that? We don't know the context and the purpose. We can infer from this certain things, because I will tell you one thing that is 100% certain in the security world. There is one thing that I can say with absolute certainty. If you stick a web server up on the internet, it will get whacked. Maybe not successfully, but it will get whacked. And it will be between 17 seconds, approximately, and eight hours, depending upon where the sweeps are. 100% certainty, it'll get, it'll get attacked. Not necessarily successfully, if you've done your job right, but um, it will get whacked. So that's the one thing we know, right? We know that that front end is going to receive a lot of nasty traffic. Irrespective of authentication, authorization, any of those other things, we know that that front nick right there, this one right here, boom, is going to get whacked, 100%. All right. So knowing that, that gives us some information, but we don't have the rest of this context. Now, I made up this little mnemonic because I'm dumb, and I can't ever remember anything. And so I need something to help me climb into it and say, what do I have to ask about stuff? Um, and these are the things you have to ask. This is all in the book, by the way. Um, these are the things you have to ask in order to... Um, have enough information to do a threat model well. And so you've got to know the threat landscape. That's a piece we'll spend a little time at, 
but if you go and talk to um, uh, Tony UV and Marco Moreno, they actually um, know a lot more about this. They are really, really good at this stuff. Um, but you've got to know your threat landscape, what's relevant and what's not relevant. As we said, the reason I put a uh, web thing up there is because there's 100% certainty it'll get attacked by somebody and lots of somebodies. Okay, you have to understand what risk posture your organization requires. And I give you an example. If you only see your customer once and you are always just seeing a customer once and you don't care about whether they like you or not, do you care about cross-site scripting? Because cross-site scripting is an attacker using, misusing your website to attack your customer. So anybody who cares about their customer is not going to like it. But if you don't care your, about your customer, I would argue morally you should care about it. That's a different point. But as a business thing, do you really care about that cross-site scripting? Will it really harm your business model? The answer is no, because you only see your customer once. You don't care whether they get whacked or not. So that might be off your radar, your risk posture, that, that your customers get whacked by your website. You might not care. I would argue morally that's wrong, but um, from, a, from, a, from a pure business standpoint, I'm sure there are businesses that run themselves that way. And so what I'm, all, all I'm suggesting is you've got to know the risk posture. You've got to understand how much risk tolerance and what's important and what's not. Um, a speaker this afternoon, Tony UV, made some really strong points about this. So I, I'm not going to go into that, but because it's a whole long, how you find that out is, is not that easy. Um, you also have to know what's already in place. What can you use and what are the limitations that you have to put into your threat model? So if you already have an authentication system, you know, like in a web environment, why would you build another one? You need to know how that works and you need to know how you hook it. But you also need to know if it has some weaknesses you might need to make up for in your code. So you want to know what the structures are. And then you got to know this stuff, the data sensitivity that you're playing with. And I would argue that whenever you ask that question, data sensitivity, you always want to say, what is the highest sensitivity here? Because if you just add, you know, people answer things like, well, most of it's public. What about that other little bit? Oh, that's top secret. Okay, because you have to kind of build for the stuff that's you know, most difficult. You got to know about execution environments because C executes really differently than Java and it has different problems. Um, and uh, you have to know how things are deployed. Okay, you with me? There is no book of correct answers to any of these questions. Each organization is different. You have to do your organization. Investigate yours. Okay, now we're going to play with some architectures. Um, one thing, as I, as I looked at the way I work and the way that real practitioners work and the way things really e evolve in real situations, is that I end up with a lot of different views because it's too much information to get one view, onto one view. Now, I have seen a couple of interesting ways to do that, but basically, you come in and you get something like those three boxes and then you make them draw more, right? So, here's a... <laughs> Here's, a, here's, an, here's an architecture. Cold call on you. It's a little unfair, but cold call. What can we infer from this, if anything? From a threat model, from an attacker's perspective, do we know at all what's being protected? Go. Sure. Hit it. Hmm. Good point. We don't know how we get at it. Um, do we know it at all what it does? Can we infer anything about what it does? Yeah. Go, Krista. Damn, that's he's he's smart. This guy. This actually is a architecture. I had it redrawn for the book because I didn't want to get sued. But it's actually taken from an actual real architecture. Architecture as in marketing architecture. It told me nothing. I couldn't threat model it. And that's why I stuck it in the book. I had it redrawn, though, because I didn't want to get sued. I didn't want anybody to know that I was actually using a real architecture. We changed the names to protect the maybe not so innocent. 
But it actually, Christoph's right, it actually came from a business intelligence thing. And these are sources and whatnot. We're gonna actually threat model a real business intelligence, not a real one, a fictational, fictional one, but one with a lot more information than this, I hope. Uh, but, uh, nice. <laughs> But it's still, um, it's not enough. It's not the right stuff. So you got to get the right stuff. That's my whole point here. So um, let's come back to Web Sakurama. Let me tell you about this. Let me give you some of the three S's here. Web Sakurama is an apolitical, sock, fictional. This is all fictitious, based on real stuff, but fictitious. Um, Web, Web Sakurama is a, supposedly, a sock online sock retailer and I, I, I'm fictitious thousands of socks <laughs> catalogs of socks every sock you can imagine bicycle socks knee socks toe socks yeah this is their business and they're fairly successful I'm giving you the sort of business stuff they want to protect their customers. They feel like their customers, whether they've bought anything or not, any visitor to their site is precious because someday they might buy socks. They are apolitical though. The reason I tell you that, they try to avoid controversy, because not all retailers do, because that's their business model. So they're risk averse to um, adverse, uh, like hacktivism or, or adverse publicity. You with me? I'm just setting the stage here. This is the stuff you gotta know. They're fairly risk averse about taking, they want to protect their customers' data and their, um, and their uh, catalog. They don't want anybody to come and change the catalog. They sell the socks they sell, and they don't want anybody to come and stick pornography in there or anything else, okay? Um, and they, they try to avoid anything but socks. That's all they're interested in, selling socks and doing a good job. Um, the way this architecture works, there's a web server up in front. Um, this is an application server that also builds applications. Anybody ever hear of those things? They were popular about 10 years ago. There were things that would build applications, no coding involved. You just go and stick a bunch of stuff, a bunch of phrases together and it builds an application. That's what this is, but you can also add your own Java applications. It's a Java web server with some other stuff on top of it that's also Java. It's running in a Java web server container. Um, it's pretty standard. Um, and this is a database server which has a whole bunch of databases it serves. Okay? You with me? Okay, so let's play a little here. Where do you see, what's the stuff that's worthy of protecting here? Where do you see that? Ah, good. Anybody else? Browser. Um, can we protect the user's browser? How do we do that? Um, yeah, yeah, we want we want to make sure that they don't people don't get attacked. Right. Very good. Yeah. Others? Yeah. Very sensitive to that. Yeah. Very sensitive to that. How about these configuration things here? What if somebody can change the way an app works? Yep, that's very true. Yes, very true. Um, how about somebody inserting an app into this, into this web server, into this uh, app server? Think they'd not like that very much? Having their own app in there? To who knows what? Siphon off financial stuff and whatever. So there's a bunch of, we've gotten a bunch of targets here. Where are the ways the attacker can get into this? Let's imagine that for a minute. How does the attacker get to these targets? And why might they go after these targets? Hit it. Money and data, they would come into both. They could come into the internet, but they could also come into uh, employees or compromised employees. It's a whole back end for every one of these systems, isn't there, in order to administer it. What if you get on the employee net which is, let's say for a moment, it's a little bit open, and you, you, or you fish an employee. Go. They are. I haven't got that far, but let's go.
Right. So one of the things about this kind of system, good point. One of the things about this kind of system is that the messages walk right through whatever firewalling you have. It has to work that way. And so you've got a, you know, you've got a perfect package for sending attacks. And they can flow all the way, if you're not careful, to the database server or even into the database and sit there and whack people picking up product. So there's a whole flow that happens here where you can, you can get some stuff here, you might get some stuff here, you might have to do some work here, and so on through the chain because in order to process the message, you have to take it backwards through the, through the layers. I think that's what you were meaning. It's a good point. Okay, let's move on. Um, how do we do this? I like to start at the organization's purpose. So the first time I get to a new organization, I sit around and I talk to a lot of people. Um, luckily, I'm now senior enough that the top people will actually hear me. Um, that wasn't always the case and took years originally. You know, when I started down this game, who is this Schoenfield guy? I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna answer his email. He's not important. Um, but you know, over the years, it's gotten a lot easier but you need access. You need to talk to decision makers and leaders to get the organization. Now, if you've worked at a place a long time, you already know this stuff. You know, you, you've seen the vision and whatever. Um, but you also have to know what is the system's purpose? What goal does it serve for the organization? What part is it going to play? Um, and uh, then you start looking at the architecture. Um, I like to look at things that are functional I think I've got, yeah, good. Wow, I must have put these slides together because that actually works. Uh, this is uh, fictional. Again, all the architectures in my book, and these are all drawn from my book, are fictional to um, any, any um, similarity to living or dead systems is purely coincidental. Um, I didn't want to get sued, so I took all the real architectures and turned them into something else and changed the names because uh, I don't want to get sued by anybody but it's actually, you know, pretty close to, a, to an enterprise conceptual architecture that I actually once saw. So you can also count on that these things are based on reality. So this is the way the enterprise architect may look at an enterprise. Because what they're interested in is really different than what you're interested in as a threat modeler. So here's the little problem, is the people you work with who you need to explain what's going on are not going to be looking at security the way you are. They're not going to be looking at their thing. Their views are going to be really vastly different. Notice how things are, are really clumped in very businessy ways here. Very businessy ways. Supply chain, e-commerce. Mm, the only thing they've broken out is presentation layers, and then there's this troublesome little box at the bottom. Anybody ever seen the security box in an architecture? You know, for years this bugged me and I, was, I would really kind of make fun behind people's backs. And then I checked myself and really slammed myself and said, wait a minute, if I were an enterprise architect, I need to box up this very messy and, and cross-functional thing called security and put it in a box and put it to the side because I can't deal with it. And that's why they do that. It's so inaccurate, it's laughable, right? However, if you're the enterprise architect and you're actually trying to work out how all of these things are going to get integrated, this is problematic. So you stick it in a little box and put it to the side so you can manage the complexity. That's why it's there. Um, but obviously, we can't deal with it that way. So this is a breakout of that same architecture in a functional manner. We're not going to spend a lot of time on it um, because I want to move along. Uh, one thing I want to point out, because we're going to get into it in the middle, is the message bus goes across the security layer, the trust boundary. You see that? In other words, this is the thing that breaches our security model. Just remember that. We'll need that in a minute. Um, but you see, it starts getting really busy when you break it out functionally, and you break it out into some zones. Maybe it's not too busy just yet. We're, we're going to just take one system out of this and and threat model it. So, so you don't worry if you can't get to everything on that screen. Just kind of take in how busy it is and how I've broken out the same stuff. Now we have these e-commerce section 
is one whole section and it starts to make sense from a functional perspective. And the um, uh, supply chain is separated out as a separate set of systems, which is very typical. It's called an extranet. Um, now, if I stick all the flows in there, look what happens. It's pretty much impossible. It's an eye chart. And this is why you want to start breaking stuff down when you get to there and you're trying to get every bit of information all on this thing. No, break it down. Because you won't be able to, um, you, uh, you won't be able to understand it. Okay, I use this mnemonic, uh, ATASM. The reason I stuck architecture first is because it sounds better than TASM. Um, really, it was the, y any, any way you go in this. In fact, um, a really great threat modeler once said to me very recently, wherever you start here, you have to do all these things, and it's a circle. And so you start anywhere that's convenient that you like and then you move through all of these things. I like to start at architecture because I like to know what I'm talking about, but you could start elsewhere. You could list all the relevant threats, you know, or all the defenses. You just have to do all of these, okay? Um, unfortunately, um, these hide a whole lot of steps. We're, we're gonna do these, so, so don't worry if you don't take it in, but um, you know, I think they'll post the, the deck and whatnot. So don't, don't worry if you, if you can't take it in. And this is just one high-level outline. Um, these things break down even to even more stuff. I point out it is a highly recursive process. Um, and it tends to be fractal, as John Stevens says. Um, and so uh, you really, what this tries to show you is you really, you could get anywhere in here and discover a whole new bunch of stuff that you have to dig into and you have to go back to the top and start again. So it's non-linear a lot of the time. So those of you who have really the definite engineering mind and you gotta go step by step by step by step, let it go. When you're threat modeling, it's much better. Good threat modelers sort of know where they are and can pop back to a different place. Yes, please. Yes, that's very true, and that was actually uh, a good piece of the target hack, I would, I would argue. It's a good point. And, and a lot of times you do deal with that, and a lot of times the defenses are sometimes process and not technology, too. So process definitely comes into it. So let's think about threats. Um, when I teach this at Intel Security, I actually spend a half an hour, a total half an hour, listing all the threats. It's always the same threats. We know who the threats are a at a gross level. Um, but I make people kind of go through it and get their brains wrapped around it because it somehow helps to unlock the whole process a bit. I don't have time to do that today um, with you, but this would be kind of a, a, th a, a matrix. I, 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 it's actually based on some work by um, Jack Jones who wrote FAIR, um, and uh, I'm a big fan of FAIR. Um, but I just wanted to show you that you can actually understand the threats and how to defend them by categorizing them. If you pick out the attributes of a certain, and this is a big class, you can, you can poke holes in this, this is a stereotype. Any single cyber criminal might be more or less clever than this. But as a general rule, they're very risk uh, aversive. They usually don't have much exposure you, you, to the, uh, you know, only through the web interface and that's how they try to get in. Um, you know, they're, they have limited, unless they're, you know, um, uh, socially engineering your, your employees or whatever, they don't have inside access. Um, and they're very risk, and they're, they, they, they tend to use very medium to low uh, sophistication attacks. And really it's about, if your house is, is more secure than the one next door, that's the one that keeps getting hit. Yeah. I don't, I, I didn't understand the question, I'm sorry. So when you're looking at threats, are you looking at big things that are just zero across the board, you're looking at network security, content security, and triple A across the board, and all your layers of... Absolutely. Uh, so those are already built into the threat model. 
Yeah, you can assume those if they're in place, if the system that you're looking at is using that stuff. If it's a complete exception, then all bets are off. That's one of those things in that first, that slide I showed you, the three S's, that you have to assess. But that's basic before you start threat modeling. Yes, it's understood, absolutely. Okay, so this is a summarization of that, of a, of a couple of different threat agents. Um, it's in the book. Uh, it's, it, you know, I just want to point out that different kinds of threat agents may or may not be relevant, and the way they attack is different. Their sophistication is different, and that kind of helps. Like, if you only have to, like, we take Web Sakurama, they're only worried about um, cyber criminals, really. Um, you know, there's not much intellectual property in the world of socks, which is why I use that as an example. Um, and so they're not worried about, about um, you know, some third, you know, nation state stealing the stock, sock catalog since it's public anyway. They just don't want it changed. Very different. Okay, so, uh, and there's not much intellectual property in a, in a standard web system. They just want to sell socks online. Okay. So that's very different than someone who maybe makes routers and has crypto routines in those routers. Very different. And we're gonna look at an example like that in a minute. Um, so what you wanna know is who, who are, are your attackers and what are their goals? What are their ultimate goals? And then it's good, then you break it down to say, okay, well how do they get to those goals? What are their system objectives? Um, I'm not gonna go into this stuff um, real deeply, but this is the kind of chart you might make for yourself. And you only need to do this kind of once-ish. You don't really need to do it like for every system if you have a fairly well-known set of threats and, and, and attack types. But it's good to do that. Okay, let's talk about risk a little bit. Um, anybody ever seen this equation here? Risk equals probability times annualized loss. It's in every InfoSec 101 course, right? Except we can't calculate it. We don't have any actuary tables. So what's a poor security architect to do? Well, I'll propose that first you have to know something about your own risk tolerance because <laughs> it's not your risk tolerance that's important, it's your organization's as a professional, okay? You gotta know what risk posture is required, so get yourself factored out. Um, and then I'm gonna propose this. This is based on FAIR, but I have simplified it tremendously. Jack Jones did read that chapter. He did make lots of comments. I did change the chapter uh, in favor of his comments. However, he did say it was acceptable. So I feel on pretty good, solid ground here as a practitioner that I've got some real grounding here. All you need to do is treat each one of these as a binary for our purposes. You can calculate this stuff, but you don't have to as a practitioner. You just need to treat those as a, bi as a Boolean. If you can interrupt any one of those, you've interrupted the, what I call a um, credible attack vector. Okay, so here's some, some very light logical stuff here. You can interrupt exposure, which is the usual way to do this. Um, then you've killed the uh, credible attack vector, and thus you've lowered the possibility of exploitation. So this is a very, um, and you can do this very fast. You can do hundreds of these in a few minutes in your mind, once you know this stuff. And so we can say that credible attack vector is risk rating is um, something times impact. And so um, remember, there's no risk, none, if there's no impact. And I'll give you an example. How much impact is there for a buffer overflow on a Windows machine that can only be exercised at debug level privileges? I actually argued with a <laughs> security guy about this, very good one. How much risk is there? How much impact? Zero, because if you already have debug privileges, you're having your way with the machine. You're not exercising buffer overflows. You're doing what you came to do, whatever that is as an attacker. You're not sitting around doing buffer overflows. That's what researchers do. If anybody's a researcher, I don't mean to insult you, but that's what researchers do. 
but that's not what attackers do. They're already using the machine for a botnet or looking at your keystrokes or whatever they want to do. So you have to have impact. You don't care about vulnerabilities that don't. That's a way of doing this really fast. Got to be fast because that's the game. Sometimes a uh, threat modeler will see four or five systems in a day. Yeah. Uh, now, well, you can, you can set this up. Now, that gets into just good enough risk rating. Can I talk to you about that afterwards? Because what we did is we took all these things and then we gave them uh, numbers based on situations between 0 and 1. And then... Well, you can treat them that way. That's what I said. And, and that's for the quick mental. But if you wanted to play with this and turn it into a rating system, then you take those and give them a number between 0 and 1. And then you multiply it against some kind of rating of impact. And boom, you've got a number between, you know, you've got a number that you can repeat. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it might be. I'll, I'll change this. It's greater than, oh, yes, less than 0 and greater than 1. Yes, absolutely. It's a perfect number. <laughs> let's move on. Thank you, Greg. Um, okay, so let's have some fun. This is, in fact, uh, let me tell you a little bit about this so you have the right context. This is, in fact, supposed to be a business intelligence system. Fictitious, again. Name changed to protect the innocent or the guilty or something. Um, it's a business uh, intelligence system, and I want to play with it with you all, if you will. Um, it's behind, it's on the corporate network and behind the, the public firewalls and the public sections. It's all on the local network, except if you recall from that, that other thing, remember I said pay attention, this one bus goes into the public sector and carries messages somewhere, not to the business intelligence, but to the data. That's an important piece here. You have to know this is a uh, router manufacturer, something like a famous couple of famous router manufacturers that someone named Schoenfield might have worked for some at one point or other. Um, and uh, they are very risk averse. Their sales model is you sell the highest quality routers in the world that are the most dependable so that you can raise your prices that does sound like some real world company, doesn't it? Um, and uh, that you, uh, no, entirely dis fictitious, his name is Digital Discus. Um, I made that up. And uh, they sell routers, and this is their business intelligence system to gather stuff about their business. It's all in the internal network, but these data sets do get data from, from external applications. Do you know enough? It's, it's monitored. There's security monitoring. There's an identity services here. So this is the thing. It pretty much touches every data store behind the firewall in order to put stuff together. You with me? Now let's look at the actual system. Anybody want to try playing threat modeling with this? Want to look for attack surfaces? Let's just find the attack surfaces. Oh, and uh, Digital Discus has been the subject of nation-state attacks. They have been the subject of hacktivist attacks, so they try to avoid all controversy. They still have been labeled a big global corporation enemy um, by some activists. And they have, um, they have uh, of course, uh, many competitors in many countries and who would love to get their intellectual property. So that's the, the threat landscape. And the, uh, the ever-present cyber criminal stuff going on always. So now, where do you think the attack surfaces here are? What do you think? Uh, do you need me to explain this? I guess I can. So there's a system, and it touches all these guys, all this data, and it pulls all this data in, and then it starts correlating. Attack surfaces. You see any just immediately? <coughs> if I were the wily attacker, how do I get into this system? Thank you. I'm sorry? Take the bus. Yes, take the bus. That's good. And get into the data stores. So what you're saying is any attack has to get in here from the data. Yes? True. You see, 
These two things are obvious attack points, as John said. Anybody else? Let's go on. Here's the system as it stands. I think that's probably small enough to see. So now let's try to find some. And so how would you defend against that? You got data. What are you going to do that you don't necessarily trust, that you have to suck in and parse? What are you going to do to protect that? Let's walk through the whole thing since I only have five minutes. You had it from the expert right there. Yeah, um, input validation is critical. And this is a very hard input validation to do. The data gathering piece has to do tremendous input validation. And this is actually a very difficult problem. Why? Because it has to be a general, it has to take data in many, many different forms. So it has to understand. One of the hardest parsing problems we have is the general file parser because you have to be general enough to take anything, but you have to know all these different formats and know whether it's legal. Go. Uh, and general file parsing or general data parsing is even more difficult. Very difficult problem. However, that is the answer there. You can't trust the data. Great answer. Um, so this is a, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about why I use these red things, which I've done like tons of times in my life teaching this, is um, I have a lot of trouble with long lists. Long lists, which a lot of threat modeling methods and it may work for you. Uh, I know uh, Robert and I were talking about this earlier. It may work for you to see a long list of assets or a long list of attack surfaces in words. But for me, about the second or third um, attack surface, I begin to glaze over and forget what I'm thinking about and how it matches to a structure. So I like visual. That's just a personal stylistic thing. I don't want to suggest that's the right way to do it. If you like stride and dread, do it. Get started. Dell and I are going to talk about that tomorrow. Just do it. Um, I'm not a big fan of those, but that is not a comment about their efficacy. It's only a comment about stylistic preference, OK? Um, but I like visual because it puts me understanding where my attack surface is in the general structure of the architecture. And so I'm very fond of visual representations. And I also tend to take whatever the architects give me and then try to work with that. Um, so that they understand where I'm going, so because it's an interactive process. That's a stylistic thing, based on my kind of work and the way and the kinds of architectures I need to look at. Um, but you may be different. So you see, I use these little <laughs> red arcs, and literally, I do that. I get a red marker and I mark on the thing, and I say, I think this is attack surface here. I think this is an attack surface here. Okay. Don't ever forget your 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 controlling data like configuration either. All right. Um, I'm just going to go through this a little faster. The data sources, as was pointed out by John, are um, wickedly important because they might hold attacks because they take untrusted data. All right, um, where am I? Now we put some users in here. Are there some attack surfaces here? I'm just going to go through this really fast. Obviously, there are. So this system has to protect itself from those things as well. And that pretty much gets us to the thorniest problem here. I don't think I have time for this, but um, you can talk to me afterwards. The identity services is a very thorny little problem that would be worth if I had lots of time to go over. Identity is the problem. Well, sure. <laughs> That's very true. The but I, uh, is it identity? And I oh. oh, yes, it is. Thank you. <laughs> this is a, this is a, uh, this, um, this slide deck is a, is a class in, in formation. So as I said, it's all the experiment. All right. Um, I will say one last thing, and then I'm just going to turn it over to you. Getting requirements into 
implemented is an entirely different story and, and lots of work needs to be done there. Composing the requirements well will help. Um, but that's a distinct discipline. I'm not going to go into it today. Uh, you'll notice I just dodged a whole bunch of typical threat modeling issues. Uh, dodged those bullets. Um, I have those are stylistic preferences, not necessarily right or wrong. And a little shameless self-promotion. I have books out there. Um, yes, I will sign your books if you can catch me. Um, and here's a bunch of ways to contact me and to find out about what I'm doing and where I am. I will tell you one thing, though. If we haven't had a meaningful interaction and you send me a LinkedIn friendship, I will ignore it <laughs> because I try to keep my LinkedIn to people I actually have interacted with for real. And so when you look at who I'm connected with on LinkedIn, those are all real people that I know. They're not, you know, people who just want to be hooked to me because I wrote a stupid book. Um, so uh, we're, we're supposed to be done, but it's the end of the day, so I think we can carry on. Any questions? Just ignore that LinkedIn request I sent you. <laughs> and I would, you know what, John, from you, I would say yes, because we've had lots of meaningful interactions. <laughs> Yeah, Christoph. I'm curious how you do this as well in that cloud of threat modeling with uh, layered attackers. Right? So you have this enterprise, and then there's the data that goes over that, which could be a problem. Then there's uh -huh. uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and afterwards, but then there's a method for us for both stuff, like fetching lots of things and putting them into the entry. Yeah. You know, let's go back, because that was actually a whole. Yeah, one like ours, but there's really two, two different attack systems there. there. There are. There are. And in fact, I dodged that bullet in this talk because I didn't want to go down it because message buses are a whole, a whole thing. In the book, I talk a lot on this architecture about a good security model would deal with this problem. And actually, a good way to deal with that, a good defense is you have whatever you take in from here, you never pass through here, you recompose. As a, as a you know, you use, of course, you use li vetted libraries and whatever, but you recompose, and you also have to have a lot of, somebody else said it, you have a lot of restrictions on this guy so that uh, only traffic only goes to intended places and it's limited and you also authenticate to the bus all of those are message bus you know security things that you need to to conscience and I kind of skipped over that because I felt like you know I can only do so much in 50 minutes or whatever but you're absolutely right any other questions let me go back to the question and answer slide yes sir Oh, come on, that never happens, does it? <laughs> that never happens. Yes, so that's where the fractal part of this comes in, where you have to look holistically, and then that opens up another threat model. That happens all the time, and you have to then say, okay, my threat model is incomplete. My threat model needs to account for, just as it needs to account for the message bus, in fact, you also need to account for that. I, I actually go into a situation like that. One of my examples has that kind of thing where they add a payment processor and suddenly it changes the whole threat model. Yeah, very true. And really, I, what I do is I step back and say, okay, here's more stuff. So people often ask me, so what about when the threat model happens at the very end? We're going to talk about that tomorrow. <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't give that away. No, I won't give it away. Come to our talk tomorrow. We'll talk about what happens when you get the threat model or when you get a big change at the end. Well, that's, that's where the question comes from. Because, yeah. hey, we've, we've done all this and we think we have a secure platform. Oh, and somebody's doing an ETL data extraction. And then, and then shipping it to gosh knows where. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I play a really long game. And only when something is really, really terrible do I, do I call foul and say, no, that's a personal style because I have to get along with my s sister and brother architects or they will just disinvite me from the party. So there's a lot of little personal stuff here. You have to find your own style. So I play a long game. I say, okay, well, we'll write an exception now, but we're going we're gonna to threat model that and we're going to find out what it is. You know, because it already exists. You know, and, and I kind of try to play a really long game. Your style may be different or your organization may require a different you know, response than that. I think that's very, very unique to the experience. You know, if I found out that, you know, 
the data were all sitting, you know, on a public web server, and that's where it was being shipped to, with uh, open FTP, anonymous FTP, my reaction would be very different. Like over my dead body, are we going to move one inch further? You know, I think it's very highly dependent. You know, but but I would caution anybody: whatever powers you have to say no, use them wisely, because if you get disinvited to the party, one of my metrics that I use, because I have 70 architects that I actually work with and lead. And one of the metrics I use is, do they get invited after, you know, are they continually being invited and seen as, as adding value? Because that's a problem. So if you get too, um, what's the word I want? Um, grumpy with people, th yeah. Yeah, that people just disinvite you. Smart developers disinvite you. Any other questions? Or you can, you can talk to me after the session, if you like. I'm, I'm here, and I'm here tomorrow, too, or during reception. <laughs>